I would invite you to rise and we turn together to page 94 in the front portion of our hymnal for our brief order for confession and forgiveness. Using the words on the right hand side of the page. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sins and whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with the power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. We join our voices and together sing our gathering hymn, hymn number 335.
Sisters and brothers in Christ, beloved children of God, grace, mercy, and peace be with you all. We share together the Kyrie found on page 138. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. O God, rich in mercy, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world and rescued us from the hopelessness of death. Lead us into your light that all our deeds may reflect your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I would invite you to be seated. Our first reading for this service comes from the book of Numbers, the 21st chapter, beginning with the fourth verse. From Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. We pray, pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Word of God, word of life. We share from Psalm 107. Uh, please respond with the bold portions of the text. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew nearer to the gates of death. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. Our second reading comes from Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus, the second chapter, beginning with the first verse. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of the flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, 
he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is, a, it is the gift of God, not the results of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Word of God, word of life. I would invite you to rise as we share together the gospel acclamation. Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Lord. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believed in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. I would invite you to be seated. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you in peace from God our Father, from our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to step back just briefly into the Old Testament lesson from Numbers because there's something in there really interesting. I just want to give you a a new thought before we jump into other things. You remember that text that I read? The people were on their way from Egypt where they were serving as slaves and they were murdered and beaten. And finally, God called Moses and empowered Moses and Moses' brother-in-law Aaron to lead his, God's chosen people, out of Egypt. And they were complainers. I mean, they complained about everything. They didn't like the food. They didn't like the fact that there wasn't water in the jars right away. They complained about everything. But as they were doing that, one of the things is they they said this, why have you brought us up out of the land of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. We detest this miserable food. It kind of reminded me of young children They detest this miserable food that they don't have. Think about that for a moment. The things that are detested that you do have, that you complain about and don't have. It's an oxymoron. It's it's how the human mind churns through things. Never at peace, never finding a moment in which there's a calm and an understanding and a presence of something, someone beyond themselves. Then we move forward, and let's go into the epistle reading for just a moment. If you notice that we, we share those words in our brief order for confession and forgiveness, we declare to ourselves and to one another the reality of what it means to be a child of God. And in there he talks about, uh, Paul does, about the things that, that are consistent in the world, You were dead through trespasses and sins. We make that confession because that allows us to stand at the foot of that which holds the vision of eternal life. And when we declare our sins, our ears are free to hear the love of God reverberate through all time and space, the echoing of God's gracious love seen in forgiveness. 
And then we step into John today for our gospel. And one thing about John is that um, John is a feast. He's not, his writings are not uh, fast food. In order to fully grasp, well, in order to be fully grasped by John's writings and the drama that he leaves us with Jesus, you sometimes have to read several chapters. And sometimes you have to read a chunk here and skip some to get to where Jesus concludes a thought begun. Today we get dumped in the middle of a text and it's not really helpful, it's not really, it doesn't really resolve itself for us. So I would encourage you when you go home, pick up your Bible and open to John chapter 3 and read those first 12 verses because that is the foundation upon which this is built. And in today's text, we hear Jesus saying a phrase three times. And that means it's ultimately the importance of what Jesus is talking about. But I got to stop because I think so many of us hear this text, John 3, and we run to where? John 3, 16. You can't go to a baseball game. Well, you can now probably, but years ago, you couldn't go to a baseball game without seeing John 3, 16 all over the place. In fact, there was an organization that had somebody sitting behind home plate with John 3.16 on, knowing that the cameras were going to focus in on that. We love John 3.16. We encourage it into our children. For God so loved the world that he gave his only beloved son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That is the anchor upon which we create the faith for our children as they grow. But I would suggest that we should look a little deeper and have a bigger feast because it's John 3, 17 in which God tears himself open and lays bare what he's up to. It is John 3, 17 in the moment in which God does that that we see the purpose of Jesus. I'm not of the school that runs around in the time of Christmas which begins on December 25th not the day after Thanksgiving. I'm not of the group of people that run around believing that Jesus is the reason for the season. Christ is the season. It's what? Christmas, the coming of Christ. Why was Jesus born into this kingdom? Because you all and me, we need somebody to get us out of the mess we create for ourselves. That is, the sin which populates our life and dribbles behind us and causes pain for ourselves and for others. And so we declare simply this, that God loves us. Sometimes my parents probably didn't. Sometimes you struggled with that with your own children or nieces and nephews or neighbors or church people. But in John 3, 17, God speaks this world. In this word, indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but parenthetically, to save it from itself. You see, God doesn't need my help to condemn me. He doesn't need your help to condemn you. Your sin in and of itself is enough. It takes nothing else. But in order for your sin to be forgiven, in order for your sin to be removed, in order for you to be made a child of God, pure and holy, it takes an act of the holiness of God. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn it, but to redeem it, to save it from itself. That's the love of God, that he will reach out into this kingdom to pair off from you, to peel away from you that sin so that you might see the salvation of your eternal life standing in front of you. And how does that work? Well, three times Jesus says it. He begins this way, And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That's the first word that Jesus talks about as he opens this up, John 3, 14. He begins with those words. 
And then John 3, 16 empties itself in. For God so loved the world, and he goes on, so that everyone who believes in him. Jesus is pushing us, not to the point of saying, we've got to do something to get out of this mess, but we've got to believe in something. Faith is a verb. It's a transitive verb. It demands an object. The word for, for faith in, in, in Greek is simply this. Now remember, you get to participate. Here it is. Clear your voices. <clears throat> Join with me. I'll say the word first, and I want you to say it after me. It's a beautiful word. The word in Koine Greek is pistis. 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 Faith in, faith for, faith from, faith to. You've got to put an object there. It just doesn't sit. And when we make faith like we do with love a noun, we idolize it. My faith. We talk about it as though we own it and we possess it. Faith owns us so that we can be turned to see that our faith is in Jesus Christ. It's in the work of Jesus that he did in this kingdom when he was here. It's faith in the work of Jesus that he did on the cross for your sake. He died. It is faith in Jesus' resurrection that unites you and my, myself to his resurrection so that we might live with him. But Jesus doesn't let you stumble over that once. No, he props you up and brings it, brings it again. Those who believe in him are not condemned. It has nothing to do with what you do. What you do will follow what you believe, but you anchor, you're anchored in that word, that work of God, giving you faith, the power to believe that, yes, when I do this, I gain nothing. I already have it. It is God shining through and taking care of it. But then he doesn't leave it there. He goes on about those who do not believe in God condemn themselves because they reject, they push away that gift of faith. They move that back away from them so that they can be in charge. They can make the decisions. They can do what they want. They are the ruler of their life. They are their own personal savior. And they live in darkness and they suffer e eternal condemnation. But he gets to the end. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Faith sets you free to do and to live and to be in God. That's the richness of God's love and grace and mercy. That's what Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus when he peeled everything back and he gave them what we would call the spiritual milk, that which sustains them. This is all you need to know. He simply said, but God who is rich in mercy, mercy, rich in mercy, God is so rich in mercy. He doesn't give you what you deserve. He shares with you what he wants you to have. What is that great love in which he has loved you? Even though you were dead because of your sin, he made you alive together with one another and with Christ. And then he says it. By grace you have been saved. There ain't nothing else added to that, as my southern friend would say. It is enough that by grace you have been saved. It is God's will, God's work. So the God who comes in Jesus, who loves everybody, is anchored in faith we are to him by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then in the moment that faith becomes active, faith becomes the livingness of God in our lives, then we see that God's grace has been all the time pulling us to him to safety, to salvation. 
To believe in God, one of my seminary professors said, to believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior, not as my personal Lord and Savior, but as the Savior of the world, is to simply be this. You are drowning in a sea of death. And a boat comes along to throw you a life ring. And your response is, now nah, I can swim to shore. You are surely going to die. Because there is no shore. Because with every stroke you take, your sin pushes you further away from what you perceive to be a shore. And along comes the ship of God. And he yells out, I have the way of life for you. And he throws that life ring out. And you grab it. It's a pure gift. You did not throw that ring. You did not fasten the rope to the end of that ring. You are not holding on to that ring on the bow of that ship. You are hanging on, clinging, that that boy that you've been sent, that life ring, is actually anchored to something that is truthful and honest, whose mercy and love will pull you aboard and offer you life. That's the only way out. It's the only way to heaven is to cling to God who draws you close because of his love. So remember, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift from God. Believe in him, Jesus says. Not once, not twice, but three times. Believe in him, for he is rich in mercy filled with grace, and loves you unto all eternity. Amen. I would invite you to rise as you are able, and we together confess our Christian faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need. Gracious God, your love unites. Give wis vision to the global church and foster cooperation and mission. Increase interreligious understanding and ecumenical dialogue. Make your church a sanctuary for all fleeing persecution, disaster, and war. Lord, in your mercy. Creating God, your love enlivens. Restore balance to the earth's fragile habitats. Preserve wilderness lands, rainforests, and wildlife. Cleanse oceans and rivers. Make us good stewards of the earth. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Righteous God, your love liberates. We give thanks for those who courageously witness to your liberating love. Free all people from the evils of racism, religious strife, and hatred. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, your love heals. Care tenderly for all those loved ones perished from pe pandemic disease in every nation. Strengthen health care workers, first responders, and caregivers. Relieve all who live with chronic illness and pain. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Incarnate God, your love enlightens. Open our hearts and minds to fresh understandings of our faith. Deepen our love for you and for one another. Teach us to pray for our enemies. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Abiding God, your love saves. Those who died in faith are made alive in Christ. We give thanks for your promise that we also will be raised to newness of life. Lord, in your mercy. 
God of life, we remember before you those of our parish whose anniversary of death we commemorate this week. Chad Guile, Dale Holubar, Deborah McLee, Ulf Odegaard. We rejoice in the gift of eternal life they now enjoy in heaven with you and all the saints who have gone before us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless our bishops Elizabeth and Amy with wisdom, humility, and compassion. Lord, in your mercy, Accompany us in our journey, God of grace, and receive our prayers of our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I would invite you to be seated and we sing hymn number 319, the songs for the gifts, and please rise on the final verse. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread of life we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Let us pray. Jesus, you are the bread of life and the host of this meal. Bless these gifts that we have gathered that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with your holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. It is, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son, so everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into this world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and his death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory now and forever in your holy church. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We share God's peace with those around us. Christ's table has been set. Your presence is welcomed.
Let us pray. Generous God, at this table we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one loaf to feed the whole world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. Loving God, bless our families and fill our homes with respect, joy, laughter, and prayer. Especially send your blessing upon Arba and Margaret Johnson, Brian and Joan Johnson, Christopher and Shannon Johnson, and their families. Protect them, guide them, and deepen their love for you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive this word. Beloved, you are God's own people, holy, washed, renewed. God bless you and keep you, shower you with mercy, and fill you with courage and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Share your bread. Thanks be to God. We close with our sending hymn, hymn number 779, Amazing Grace.